Hello and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Although this episode, uh, when it comes out, I'll be back in Raleigh, North Carolina. Right now I'm in Sacramento, California. Now, if you're a regular listener, you may know that I've taken a two week journey to a few states, you know, Florida, New Jersey, and now California. But my husband and I are scouting out the area and then, of course, the surrounding areas for a potential move here. And so far, it has not disappointed us. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. And yesterday, we went to Lake Tahoe and got to see that part of the world. And now we are have a few more days to explore a little more. But right now, we're staying in an Airbnb that is in what they call Midtown. And it is literally right by train tracks. And so the train tracks, like in the middle of the night as we are sleeping, wakes us up out of bed because it feels as though the train is coming right into the house. Like it's it's right on the other side of the house. And when my husband was looking at Airbnbs, it, it mentioned the train, but we were thinking it'd be like a little distance away. You can hear it, but not feeling like it's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, we were wrong. <laughs> we are in the middle of being done with our stay here and going to check into a hotel for a few days. Hopefully we'll get a little better rest. So pretty soon I'll be back in Raleigh and I'll be complaining about the humidity. So get ready for that. But on to today's guest, Years Muris. First, before I get into his his intro, I I want to give a big thank you to Marissa Kalkman, who's executive director at the Wellness Council of Wisconsin, who introduced me to Years because we are both speaking at at her upcoming conference in September. So let me tell you about Years. Years Muris is an assistant professor of management and human resources and a faculty affiliate at the Institute for Research on Poverty and the Center for Financial Security at the Wisconsin School of Business at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Years looks at how work shapes people's personal finances and the resulting consequences for individuals, organizations, and society. His work has been published in the Academy of Management Annals, Industrial and Labor Relations Review, Organization Science, and Research in Organizational Behavior. In addition, he's had his work featured in numerous media outlets. Some of them are the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, etc. In today's interview, Years walks us through his research, which is much more interesting than it sounds. He tells us why financial education doesn't work, And then, of course, offers recommendations on what we should be doing instead, leaving us with that tangible tip. This interview will really help you in many ways, but in particular, if you are having trouble making a case for bringing financial wellness solutions to your organization. The other thing that's interesting is it really shows you a a picture about how the different dimensions of wellness or well-being are all interconnected. Now, before we dive into the interview, do you want to receive a short summary of each week's podcast every week. Here's what I do. I end up as I'm writing up the show notes and doing the promotional work around the podcast. I also send out an email to those subscribed that goes one step further than the interview. It's my reflection of what I pulled out of the interview and at least one tip or maybe one question you should ponder or two questions you should ponder what you can do with the information and how you can apply all of it to your work and your life. Now, if that sounds good, I am going to link up where you can subscribe in the show notes. Now, without further ado, let's dive into my interview with Years Muris. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Cheers. Welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited to talk about research. And you've conducted a lot of research. I'm sure no one ever says that, but you've, you've conducted a lot of research across many settings and industries, asking the question what happens when people have financial insecurity and does it hinder work performance? Feel free to correct me if that is not the right research question, but talk to us more about what you found and what you've looked at. Usually I don't get that excitement when I, when I start talking about research (laughs) and really getting into the details of that. You're absolutely right. So a lot of my research 
or, or at least a good chunk of my research up to now has looked at how does employees' personal financial context broadly affect their performance at work and predominantly thinking about how does it affect our ability to really perform up to our potential within the workplace, within other settings where we need to perform, like, you know, when we're trying to get a degree and those kinds of things. And, you know, one of the things that kind of consistently across all these contexts you find is that when people are concerned about their finances, it affects their ability to perform, which may sound very obvious to to many people as just something intuitively that you would think would occur. But, you know, establishing that relationship is uh, is actually quite difficult. And so that's why there's a lot of research that uh, resources and time that's been invested in trying to really establish that relationship and make the case that you know, there is this effect of, of personal financial worry on performance within organizations. Well, you know, you, you know, you say like it's an obvious thing, which, you know, if you say it, you're like, oh, of course, makes sense, right? But it, it hasn't been until the past, I'd say, year or maybe two that financial wellness has become a thing and that connection's been made. But talk a little bit about why it's difficult to, when you establish that finding, the, the finding between that financial worry and performance? I mean, I have no doubt it's difficult, but can be some more specific on <laughs> why? Well, it's, so there, there are obviously certain research design and evaluation design kind of considerations to, to really establish that relationship that is not just a correlation between the two, but as actually where finances are, are driving performance. But, you know, another kind of challenge is that there is an argument for a positive relationship between financial worry and uh, performance within psychology, right? So it could be that financial worry for some people may actually be motivating and actually drive them to be a lot more productive at work in terms of securing their job security. And so piecing apart that relationship of to what extent does financial worry have this this positive motivational effect or this negative effect on people's ability to perform and what's kind of the net effect of that is a difficulty associated with trying to establish that relationship. Yeah, that's interesting. uh, Yeah, I guess there are some people who get motivated, right? Like, (laughs) you know, I have this debt or I have these bills and uh, gosh darn it, I'm going to work harder and, and get it done. Was that a finding that you saw on, a, on the regular, or it's just a factor that kind of makes it a little bit more difficult? In terms of the, the motivational driver of financial word? Right, just making that connection. I guess when we talk about financial insecurity, I, I guess I've never thought about it as it could motivate some. So how you actually tease that apart is hopefully you would eventually understand under what conditions it motivates people or detracts from their ability to perform, right? Mm -hmm. And so research is, and this is something that maybe people outside of kind of this bubble that that we in academia live in, research is something that is a progressive process, right? And so in the beginning, you try to establish maybe just a relationship between two things, and in this case, personal financial worry and productivity or performance. And then the next steps are trying to understand why is that, under what conditions does it lead to one effect or another effect. And so I think that's what we've kind of done is initially we've established that relationship. We've shown that in general, it does detract from people's ability to perform and that has that negative effect on performance. And then now we've actually gone to some of the newer work I have is showing why does it detract from that, from our ability to perform in our jobs. And so that's, that's kind of how we've been teasing that apart and trying to understand exactly what's underlying that relationship. Got it. Thank you for that. Yes, you you, you saved me. You kind of interpreted what I was trying to ask. I thought that's what you were trying to allude to. 
So tell us more about the newer research, which you just said that it does hinder work performance. And you just alluded to a few, you, some of your newer research. Can you walk us through those findings? Yeah, so one of the, the newest studies that I think is, is going to have a, a big impact once it comes out. So it's, uh, it's a study that, that's still undergoing the whole rigorous uh, publication process. Ooh, they've, they've heard it here first, here. Yeah, it is. Well, it's, Breaking it, news. <laughs> it is somewhat of an exclusive, but we're, in this study, we're using data on people's day-to-day experiences, right? So we have eight days worth of data from people. And what we find is that when people have a negative financial event, right? You can think of anything that kind of like, can happen in your life that negatively affects your finances. We find that people suffer both in the quality of their work and in the quantity of their work, which is not that surprising in the context of of the earlier stuff I've done, which has all shown that financial worry detracts from performance. But what's important about this study is that we're able to really identify why that is. And so what we argue in in this paper is that any kind of negative financial event triggers an innate hardwired response. If people view that negative financial event as a threat to their personal welfare, right? So if you say your car breaks down, right, and it's going to cost $500, that may be appraised as something that, you know, is really a threat to your well-being or your financial welfare. could also be something that you say, ah, okay, that's too bad, but, you know, that's not that big of a deal for me. But when people appraise that as a threat to their personal welfare, it triggers this hardwired response in the same way that we respond to a physical threat. So somebody's going to punch you in the face it triggers a certain response and that's that anxiety, it evokes anxiety and that anxiety leads us to focus on the source of the threat. In case of somebody wanting to punch us in the face, that's we're focused on the person who wants to punch us in the face. In the case of a negative financial event, we focus on our personal finances and that financial event. But because we focus on that financial event, It actually detracts from anything else that we need to focus on, like our work, right? And so what we're showing in the study is that on a day-to-day basis, anxiety is what drives this relationship between having a negative financial event and your work performance suffering within the same day. Mm, That is fascinating. I've got so many questions. I'm trying to think of where to go with this. Okay, so I always go back to my fascination with the differences in people. And did you look at like the people who see, I mean, I guess they're seeing as a threat and it translates to anxiety versus people it happens to in the example you just use. And they're like, oh, well, it's just, you know, kind of part of life. Did you look into that or was that not even, was that not a worry with your research and really just going on to the people who didn't handle it as well and saw it as a threat? No, no. So we do find in that paper as well is that when people have more what we call psychological resources, these are also in research, they're also called core self-evaluations. People might have heard of things like self-efficacy, self-esteem, mm-hmm. those kinds of things, right? So when people have are high in these, so they have a lot of psychological resources, they're less likely to experience anxiety in response to an, a negative financial event, right? So your car breaks down, if you're high in these psychological resources, you tend to not appraise that as a threat. And so you're less likely to experience anxiety. And so your work is less likely to suffer because of that. So there is this like internal differentiator between people who are more likely to appraise uh, negative financial events as threats to their personal welfare. Mm, okay. Thanks for the explanation. Is, um, When you looked at the whole, your whole sample size, were there people who went more to the threat? Like, how did that shake down as far as numbers? 
do you, in terms of like the people who it translated to anxiety for, and then the people who just, again, just, they have those psychological resources that they were fine. I don't know exact numbers off the top of my head. No, um, come on. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, so, so I mean, was it like a you like I, I guess what I'm looking for is do the majority of people be, view it as a threat versus oh, yeah so so even the people who are high in psychological resources mm-hmm. they still experience anxiety and it still leads to their work to suffer they're just less likely to experience anxiety okay right? So we're, so we're not saying that, you know, these people who are, say, high in self-efficacy, they're less likely to, they're, they're not going to experience anxiety. No, they're just less likely to do so. But, you know, there's, there obviously are certain negative financial events that are going to be appraised as threats even for them. Mm-hmm. Got it. So they have a financial trigger. It, it translates to a threat, gives them anxiety, and they have lower productivity at work. Now, how was the quality and quantity of work measured? Was it like a survey, a questionnaire? Like I know you said it was daily, the day-to-day experiences. So what yeah, did that so, look like? So it was a survey. So it was in that specific study, it was just as part of their daily interviews, they received a question that said, you know, did the quality of your work suffer? Did you cut back on work hours? And so that was just yes or no as part of that survey that we, where we could establish that on a daily level. But we, in past studies, we've, we've shown the same relationship of, of financial worry to performance with, you know, accidents with truck drivers, lower GPAs among college students, and, you know, lower resident care with certified nursing assistants. So we've shown this in other contexts with, you know, more objective measures of performance. Yes. And, and, and I want to go back to that in a minute, because I think you skimmed over some really strong research that you, we kind of skipped over that at the beginning, the different industries. So were people having financial events like on the regular? Like it wasn't, I'm assuming it was anxiety that they were getting quite frequently during this eight days. Yeah. I mean, there, there it was, so we have in our sample, we have about 2000 people for that study. And, you know, fi- negative financial events are pretty frequently and what's also interesting there is that because we have the eight days, what we're even able to show is that if you take the same person across those eight days and compare the days in which they don't experience a negative financial event to the days where they do, you still get the same relationship, right? So you take the exact same person, put them in a day where they don't experience a negative financial event. They're less likely for their work to suffer, less likely to experience anxiety compared to a day where they do experience a negative financial event. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to pause on that study. I want to go back to what you just said. I, you know, you just rattled off some wonderful research <laughs> about <laughs> truck drive, but you kind of glossed over it a little bit. So can you just walk us through briefly the truck drivers, the, the students, and then you said resident care. I'd love you just to, to talk about that because I think that just gives my listeners more evidence to say, hey, financial worry is a concern, right? Yeah, so most of this research, I really started when I was doing my dissertation back into my, back when I was doing my PhD. And one of the first studies I did was with truck drivers, looking at does financial worry among truck drivers affect their accident rates. And so one of the reasons I opted to to look at this population is because one, if you're trying to establish a relationship between any kind of variable and performance at the individual level, you have to consider that a lot of jobs performance is independent or or interdependent, right? So your your outcomes are dependent upon other people. With truck drivers, that's not the case. So I was able to actually establish financial worry performance for that given individual and their performance is relatively independent of anyone else. And so what I did was I did a survey with truck drivers with a a regional transportation company, and then I tracked accidents for eight months after that survey was completed. And so what I found is that when drivers reported higher levels of financial worry on the survey, they were more likely to have a preventable accident within those eight months after the survey. And so when we then looked at kind of the average 
cost of a commercial truck accident, we estimated that financial worry was associated with about $1.3 million in direct accident costs for the company per year. Geez, yeah, that's a number they can get behind to say, like, yeah, a, a truck <laughs> gets in an accident. That's no, of course, the worker safety is important, but yeah, just the cost of the, the truck being damaged. Geez, that's, that's a strong number. Yeah, and 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 so they did. So so I ended up doing some more work with them that was more focused on actually trying to address a specific issue on financial wellness in their driver population. So it definitely did motivate them to kind of look more towards financial wellness and trying to figure out how to address some of the financial issues within their worker population. Years, I'm really glad that you, they, they did something about it because that would really have to be concerned if they're like, thanks for the research. We're going to go back to what we're doing. Can you share with us what you did and any results? I can share to some extent what I did. So I... In terms of results, I, I mean, I can say the results. I, in terms of the program, I can't. I'll, I'll see how much I can say. <laughs> okay. uh, so I ended up de- developing a program for them that was called the Rainy Day Savings Program. There is some media attention that that program received. So I think there, if you kind of search that, you will, and with my name, you might eventually find a lot of information about it. Okay. Um, but it was targeted towards emergency savings. So what we found in the initial study with these truck drivers is, you know, about, I would say one third did not have an emergency savings, zero dollars. And I have to say, this is almost representative of almost every population I have worked with. Mm-hmm. Most people in almost you know, in, in, in a lot of workplaces do not have any emergency savings. And we're not talking about they don't have, you know, a month's worth of income. They have zero, nothing. And so that's the problem that we opted to try to address with a program where we designed it so there's small amounts of money taken out of a paycheck every week and then put into an account for them that they had access to. And if they kept the money in there for about six months, the company would provide an incentive on top of what they had saved. And so after a year of running the program, it was designed so these drivers would have $1,100 saved in their emergency savings account. And what we found is that about I think about 40, 45% reached that goal. So we were pretty successful in getting almost everyone to develop an emergency savings. Yeah. Thank you for walking me through that. So it's just so interesting to see just the the direct cost, right? That that's just what resonates so well with companies and that there was some a lever you could pull and the company of course, helped <laughs> helped uh, the employees reach that goal. So thanks yeah, for doing that. I think, you know, there's a, a lot of problems, I think, with how financial wellness is done. Years, you're, you're jumping the gun here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to that. But I, I, you're, you're, uh, you're asking me already about uh, programs and everything. I thought, oh, she wants to know about uh, all the, the more, what can you do about it. I'm all over the place on this one, years, but I want you to just go quickly through the GPA study in the resident care, just to continue to build the case. I think it's important. Okay. So another study we that is also now under review. So this is this is not a complete exclusive, but it's, <laughs> it's it is new. Where we did a couple of studies with undergraduates, and so what you would assume is that there is a very strong relationship between SAT scores and from high school and first semester, first year GPA, right? You would think that the students who have higher SATs should do better in college, or that's at least the assumed because SAT is really the, or ACT, uh, whichever one, is really the best measure of kind of academic potential that you have that you can compare across everyone that would enter into a university. 
And that's exactly what we find is that in general, there's a very strong relationship between SAT scores and, and call it first semester, first year of college GPA. However, when students report on their entrance surveys that they are worried about paying for college, there is no relationship between SAT scores and GPA. And what this means is that if you take two students with exactly the same SAT scores, say 1,200, the student with concerns about paying for college will perform significantly worse in their first year than a student who is not worried about their finances or paying for college. Which, yes, it's already putting people who get into college and have to pay their own way or partially pay their own way. It, it just puts them at another disadvantage. That's- yeah, so that was, that was part of the motivating and driver behind doing that study is thinking about, you know, is this a disadvantage for students, right, mm-hmm. who are... And we know that there's a lot of things correlated with being worried about your finances while you, while you're in college. Um, that, just, that may may actually double th- th- like think again about. <laughs> I always think with my kids, it's like they should be paying part of their way for college. I mean, I've got a while for it, but the study may convince me otherwise. <laughs> well, the thing is that you know what what you find is that it's just that that worry in itself detracts from your ability to perform. Right. In the same way that in the same way it does in a workplace, it does in the classroom as well, because you're so I like to think so maybe this is interesting for your listeners. So the way I like to think about financial worry is like an invisible backpack that you take with you wherever you go. And that can be your workplace, that can be the classroom, that can be kind of anywhere you can think of where you have to perform is Financial worry is like when when you were a kid and you had this big pack back full of books that you were carrying around and it was really weighing on your shoulders. Financial worry is really the same thing. It's just invisible. Is that people will put that back back on if they're worried about their finances and walk into their workplace. And as they're sitting there going through their tasks for that day, that backpack is weighing on their shoulders and it's going to detract from their ability to do anything they have to do within that day. And so, you know, you can translate that to a lot of different contexts like the classroom and that if students are worried about their finances, that backpack is going to be weighing on their shoulders and it's going to detract from their ability to perform and be productive in the classroom. Yeah, that's an excellent analogy. I like that. All right. I mentioned to get to my question, but do you think that uh, you could, not t- is, it, is it important to bring up the resident care? No, it's okay. not. It, it probably is the worst of all the studies. So. <laughs> worst how? Oh, because it's, it, it wasn't, the main focus wasn't personal finances. It's kind uh, of on the side, so. Yeah, we'll skip it. All right, let's get to let's get to the good stuff. So one of the things that you not not like that research wasn't good stuff. That wasn't a good thing that I just said. <laughs> We're gonna have to get that. You say that financial education doesn't work and that organizations kind of miss the mark when it comes to financial wellness. So I don't think you saying you think this, you know, research says this. I mean, there, there, there's 2015, an article was published that was basically, that took all the studies on financial literacy. And what it found is that there is a correlation between financial literacy and financial behavior. So people who are more financial literate, they engage in better financial behavior. But when you look at experimental studies, so these are interventions where we take a group of people We randomized some of them to get financial literacy training education. We randomized some of them to not. There is no effect of these financial literacy interventions on better financial behavior, right? And so that's a very important point is that when we're trying to instill financial literacy, it doesn't really have any effect on the things that we want to affect. Yes, that is interesting because that's most people's solution, right? Just give them more education on what they should be doing or should not be doing. So thanks for the correction. It's not just you saying it, it's research saying it. And <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to translate it. You're just the messenger, right? I'm, I'm just trying to be a, the messenger and with the hope that it's very, very hard. So, so the, I guess more turning to me, my biggest problem 
is any kind of company, and there's a lot of them now because they're sprouting up everywhere, that will tell you this is the solution to financial wellness. Like our tool, our app, our fill in the blank will fix financial wellness in your company. It won't. It's too hard, right? It's the same thing as weight loss. If there's like a, a one program that just is going to work, it usually doesn't. It's usually a lot of different things that you're trying to kind of piece away at that. But it's hard to get actual behavioral change. So what do you do? So I think to me, the solution is, is that there's a couple of steps you have to go through. Is one, first you have to figure out what are the problems within your workforce? What are these negative financial events that are actually driving anxiety within your workforce, right? And once you're at that point where you understand that, then you can go and design targeted interventions for those problems, right? And so if you find that emergency savings is a real problem in your workforce, you can design a program for emergency savings that is contextualized to your workforce. And let me give an example of that. Let's say you have a program that is completely through an app and there's a lot of those like sprouting up around now. Well, if you're working with truck drivers like I did, that will not work from the start because they won't use the app. That's just not what they do. You have to go face to face with them and introduce the program, talk to them, explain it. And that's how you get them to sign up. And that's how you get them to be engaged with it. It's not through text messages, right? right. And so, or, or apps. So you have to design programs with an understanding of your workforce and whatever it works in one population is not necessarily going to work in other populations. Yeah. You know, in some way, these are a little bit of the basics, right? But I, you know, have not asked, you know, clients what specifically. So I'm thinking of even putting a survey out there. Is there one you recommend or is it just your, what area should they ask, ask about in this survey? Like if we're getting real specific and we're saying, you know, what does that look like? Or what do you recommend that look like? In terms of, of what are your financial challenges? Yes. Yeah, so say you're asking people like, what are your financial challenges? And there's one selection that says, you know, building an emergency savings, retirement, buying a house, like all the traditional ones. Are there ones that, aside from the emergency saving, which you said, you know, one third don't have that saved up. But well, what else should you be asking about? Because the, the, the list could be endless, right? Yeah. I'll be radical mm -hmm. and say that. You should talk to your employees. What? I know. I know. It's, it's a completely new idea. You know, it's the same thing. So when we do research on the context, what we usually do is we go talk to employees, or at least we go talk to, if we can't necessarily do the employees we're studying, we're talking to people who are very closely tied to those employees and who interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis because we need to understand what the context is so that if there is something in our design that needs to be adjusted or a question we need to ask differently, that we know that before we put out any survey. In the same way, you can go and go and try to understand what are common challenges in the workforce to try to construct that list, right? And then you can always have another category in case there's some person who has something that, you know, is completely out of the realm of, of everyone else. The but, other category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you, it's, so we usually have, if we have kind of this exhaustive list, there's a lot of survey design principles that go into that. One being that if you have a, a list like that, you would have another category with fill in the blank. And that's a way to kind of allow for all option, all possible options. But, you know, you can go in and, and really try to understand what the context is. And that's going to be easier for people who already are working in that organization because they're 
they're the ones who are engaging with that workforce on a day to day basis. But you know, when we go in, we we definitely do a lot of work beforehand with the company to try to understand the workforce and kind of everything that goes on. Got it. So are there any targeted interventions or anything that you would recommend wellness practitioners like consider when they're doing targeted interventions? So let's just say that they do figure out, okay, these are the main issues in our workforce, but is there anything that they should consider as they're putting together an intervention? In terms of, you know, what to consider. So one thing that I think could be done better is usually in thinking about how to evaluate what you're doing. And a lot of companies, from my experience, do that poorly. So they, they kind of understand that, okay, we need to do a survey at the end of this program to make sure employees are satisfied with it, right? So it's, it's kind of at, every, at the end of every session, you get a survey that asks a couple of questions about the session or about the program, and you try to get, you know, I guess, engagement or, or how happy people are. But that doesn't actually allow you to establish, one, whether your program works to affect the outcomes you care about. But two, it also doesn't allow you to establish whether your program affects any of the outcomes that the people above you will care about, right? And so any kind of these targeted interventions have to come with an evaluation plan that allow you to see, is this program working? If it's not, why is it not working? right? Like what is going wrong? We're not get, having people sign up. The people who sign up are not being engaged with it and so on and so on. Why is that? And then you can, it's kind of this, this loop of continuous improvement that you have to have to try to find what is actually going to work within your specific context. Yeah. Again, you know, stating something that seems so obvious, but so many employers miss, right? Like, what are you even trying to accomplish in the first place? Are you trying to get people to contribute more to the 401k or is it more of an emergency savings? And then how can you evaluate that at the end of it to say, is it even working? And there's a lot of, I would say, technical kind of challenges that go into that. And that can go from kind of how to just design an evaluation to, you know, how to design the survey. There's a I teach a class on, it's called People Analytics, and where we teach students how to use employee data. And there's a full class session on how to design the survey, because there's a lot of kind of technical details that go into that, that will affect things like response rates, but also how accurate your information are. So I think in terms of valuation, it seems pretty straightforward, but to actually be able to execute that in a way that it provides useful information is actually very difficult to do. Yeah, no, that sounds like a class I definitely need because I do surveys all the time and I'm sure I I could screw them up. (laughs) I could really use this class. It sounds like a really uh, beneficial one, especially wellness practitioner survey all the time. So I'm assuming that is an an in-person class in Wisconsin. It's not online yes. or no so it's it's a class that's part of the MBA and undergraduate curriculum at, at Wisconsin so no so no online offerings at, at this point but it is because it's a very hands-on practical part statistics part design part using actual company data class where you really learn how to do it yeah, sometimes when I hear about all these interesting classes, it makes me want to go audit classes, not go back and get a degree but to go because there's so much, fa- so many fascinating things that to, to learn that I probably didn't appreciate back when I actually was in school. So, so before we close, is there anything I missed? I know it was a little all over the place with your research and and, and the anxiety that it, you know financial insecurity produces, which I think is so critical for my listeners to understand. Um, to some of the steps that you took us through to consider. But is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to leave my listeners with? I would say it's to kind of reiterate the point that one size is not going to fit all. And one of the things that I have learned across all these different populations is that some of the things that are going to work and some aren't. And that's just how it is. We've We've tried things that haven't worked, right? And that's why, that's partly why you do the evaluation to understand why that is and not make the same mistake. But it's, it's also not to be discouraged by things that don't work, right? So you have something, you're designing something, you're not going with the one size fits all, 
you do it and it might not work. That's okay, right? What you have to have in place is a way to figure out why is this not working and how can we make this better? And in that way, by having this kind of outlook where you're not looking at failures as something like, oh, we shouldn't do financial financial wellness, but more as, okay, how can we make this better so it actually has these desired outcomes? It's really the perspective you have to take. It's a long-term game, not a short-term game. And eventually you can get there with good design, good evaluation. You can work your way towards figuring out what is the right way to approach financial wellness within my context. Yeah, I think that's well said. I'm a huge advocate for employers and wellness professionals to talk about what didn't work, because typically when you go out to conferences or you see things, you know, it's the bright and shiny side, it's everything that worked, but it's not the painful, like this didn't work because other people can learn from what didn't work. Although every, I understand every organization is different. So I think that is a great advice. Now, years, where can people find out more about you? Do you have uh, offerings right now that you take out to employers? In terms of finding more about me, so I do, I am on and off engaged on Twitter, depending on what else I have going on. And then obviously anyone who emails me should get a response unless I am just completely lost in, in whatever is going on. But, you know, right now I, I do work with employers and that's both in terms of a research capacity, sometimes in a consulting capacity in, in trying to you know, just figure out, you know, how to do better financial wellness. And I don't think we figured that out. I don't think I figured that out at this point. So, you know, any opportunities to kind of move towards that are always welcome. And so people are always welcome to kind of reach out, talk about research or talk about, you know, interventions. I'm always happy to do that. Well, good. I'll link that up in the show notes and you will be at the Wisconsin, the Wellness Council of Wisconsin in September. So I'll link that that up as well, where you'll be talking about some of this research and a shout out to Marissa Kaufman for introducing me to you. So I'm looking forward to hearing you again. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Good to hear. Well, I look forward to meeting you in person in September and thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Oh, you're very welcome. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness Community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.